Thank you, Yvonne. Um, and thank you, Dan and Ricardo, for inviting me to speak today. Um, so I've been given the task of presenting on AI for image interpretation. Uh, so very broadly, we train deep learning models with vast data sets of labeled images. So this is supervised learning. And these models can then learn to recognize patterns in the images and ultimately detect disease. So we're typically concerned with three types of tasks, uh, classification, object detection, and instance segmentation. And here I'm using prostate MRI as an example. Um, so for classification, um, the task would be to take this image and classify it as having um, clinically significant prostate cancer or not. For object detection, the goal is to um, detect and classify a lesion and outline it with a bounding box. And then instance segmentation is a, an extension of object detection where you're detecting and classifying that object, but also delineating its boundaries. So there are many deep learning models designed for image classification. Um, convolutional neural networks really dominated the space for about a decade. Um, ResNet was very popular, um, and it's been very popular for a long time. A more recent development is the Convnext model. And vision transformers um, have also um, more recently um, been used for this task. Um, these use attention mechan mechanisms instead of convolutions. And transformers have been very successful in natural language processing, but have only more recently been used, been adapted for computer vision. And we actually heard about that in Eric's talk previously uh, with a vision transformer being used in segment anything. And then even more recently, convolution vision transformers, um, which combine the advantages of um, attention and convolutions. Uh, so this is in no way comprehensive uh, for image classification. It's just kind of a short list of the major players. Now, an early object detection model was RCNN, so region-based CNN. I mean, this uses a um, region proposal algorithm called selective search, and it groups pixels together um, in like a hierarchical grouping of similar pixels. Um, so here, this example, it might uh, detect these um, object candidates, like the bladder, for example, in blue, um, the prostate, and then a lesion within the prostate. And then it will take these um, object candidates and put them through a CNN classifier. Uh, faster RCNN was a development on top of this, um, where instead of using the selective search algorithm because it was fairly slow, um, the model actually just learns um, the region proposals. Uh, so that's uh, typically what's used now. Um, so faster RCNN is still not real-time. Uh, for real-time object detection, YOLO is probably uh, the most common architecture. Um, however, you do probably take a small accuracy hit, especially with smaller objects. Um, and transformers, again, have um, made an appearance for this uh, task as well. Uh, so once again, instant segmentation is an extension of object detection. And a mask RCNN is actually an extension of faster RCNN. Uh, so the beginning of this process um, looks the same. So we have our region proposals. Uh, we take these um, regions or these object candidates and we classify them, but we also um, process them with a CNN segmentation tool. Okay, so that was a very kind of rapid fire overview of some of the tools that we use for um, image interpretation. Um, I'll spend most of the talk actually talking about applications in medical imaging for these tools. Um, the bulk of this talk will be about cancer detection in prostate MRI, but I also want to highlight some work um, going on in our department for breast cancer detection and Alzheimer's detection. So currently for prostate MRI, um, we have a one-size-fits-all protocol, and this, does, this is used for detection, staging of lesions, and biopsy guidance. So we're requiring the axial T2 weighted image, diffusion weighted imaging, uh, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging, and a large number of other sequences. Now, many of these sequences are only useful for management if a patient actually has prostate cancer. And that includes the, the DCE sequence, which requires contrast injection. Um, so what we propose is to train a classifier just on this biparametric portion of the exam to identify um, which subjects um, are negative for CSP uh, clinically significant prostate cancer, CSPCA, with very high likelihood. 
So then these subjects that don't receive any benefit from these extra scans or from the contrast don't need to do them. Um, and then we have considerably shorter protocols for a subset of these patients and we're optimizing resources. So this figure on the left illustrates this proposed triage protocol. Um, so we have the biparametric MRI protocol. We apply a classifier. Um, if this classifier is, de if the exam is deemed to be uh, not suspicious for clinically significant prostate cancer, then we don't do any more scanning and we don't administer contrast. Otherwise, we continue with the full multiparametric exam. And the classifier that we're using for this task is a 3D ResNet. So this is a 3D convolutional neural network, so 3D convolutions. It is a branched model, so we're extracting features from our axial T2 weighted image and from our diffusion weighted images. Um, we're then concatenating features learned from these images um, into our um, classification head there at the bottom. And this is a binary classifier, um, which ultimately decides whether this patient is um, suspicious for prostate cancer or not. So we trained this model in approximately 3,000 cases um, where the, the label is um, radiologist interpretation. Um, so these are, um, this is the performance of the classifier that we're getting uh, so far. Uh, so this is the ROC curve and the area under the curve, the AUC is 0.79. Um, if you're not familiar with this metric, I'll actually use it a few more times. Um, so just to orient you, um, one, so AUC equals one would be a perfect classification, a perfect classifier. 0.5 would be random guessing. Um, so it, here we're getting an AUC of 0.79. And that red dot at the top is our operating point. And we've selected this operating point to have high negative predictive value, which means we'll tolerate false positives, um, but we really don't want false negatives. Um, so the performance of this classifier as it stands um, results in an abbreviated protocol for one in five subjects. Um, we're working on improving the performance of this classifier so we can kind of drag that um, operating point left um, so we can convert some of these false positives to true negatives. Um, approximately 60% of these subjects are negative, so we're getting one in three of those. Um, and again, we'd like to bump this uh, performance up to uh, avoid the full scan for about one in three. Okay, so we have access to a prototype lesion detection tool for a prostate MRI. And this was developed by developed and evaluated by our colleagues I'm a collaborator at Siemens um, and one of our team members, Angela Tong. So it was trained on 2,170 exams from seven institutions, including our own. The input to the model is biparametric MRI. Um, so that's the axial T2 weighted image. And this here is the calculated B1500. It doesn't look very impressive, but that hyper intense blob right there is actually the lesion. Um, so this is the input to the class or to the detection tool. And then the output is that heat map of the, um, the lesion on the image. So they evaluated this tool on 100 consecutive cases from the Prostate X Challenge. Um, and the results showed that comparing the AI to the average of the radiologist performance um, is the AI um, really, it's not inferior to the radiologist. So they do perform quite similarly. Well, what was an interesting the result is that they also compared um, radiologists versus radiologists given this AI tool. So the radiologists were able to see the AI prediction when they made their own interpretation. And the AUC goes up from about 0.83 to about 0.86. Um, it decreased interreader variability and it decreased read time by 21%. So I think it's you know really interesting that giving the AI prediction to the radiologist um, helps in a number of ways. Uh, so our group is aiming to develop our own prostate lesion detection tool. And the reason for that is that we have you know, a lot of data and a model trained um, specifically for our protocols is likely to perform better for our images, for our patients. Um, other reasons why we would like to do this is we can incorporate clinical and demographic variables. So variables like PSA, age, race, um, BMI, for example, that could be helpful in making this prediction, we can incorporate those into the model. We're also um, interested in the potential to fine tune this model for accelerated protocols. 
So we heard um, in the first talk about accelerated imaging with deep learning reconstruction. So we do have a lot of, a lot of that for prostate. Um, so we'd like to be able to fine tune these models for those protocols and also for low field prostate protocols. Um, so Hirsch Shandarana in our department um, is leading a project on low field prostate MRI. And we're recruiting um, subjects undergoing 3T MRI for prostate uh, to come back and get a low field or 0.55T scan. I um, mean, this is an example for one patient where we use that lesion detection tool and you can see that lesion on the 3T image. And in this case, out of the box with any um, retraining, uh, that is that model is able to detect this lesion on the 0.55T image as well. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, so here's an example where the model was able to detect this lesion in the 3T, but it misses it in the 0.55T, despite it actually being um, pretty visible. It's this hypo-intense region here. Um, so we're ex we expect that there would be a drop in performance in this model simply because it was trained on 3T and 0.55T is out of distribution. Uh, so again, part of the reason we're building our own model uh, for lesion detection is to be able to fine tune it for um, these low field protocols. Um, and some future work that I'm really excited about um, is the potential to be able to predict um, future risk for prostate cancer. So many of these subjects are undergoing active surveillance. So they come for a prostate exam every year. So we do have longitudinal data for these subjects. Um, so the goal is to take multiple time, images at multiple time points, um, and then other data like the, the dates of those images, the PSA and dates of PSA exams, age, race, and other um, demographic and clinical variables, and train a deep learning model to synthesize all this information and make a prediction um, of likelihood of developing this disease in the future. And the thought is that having all these images and data at multiple time points kind of gives us some insight, could give the model some insight into the disease trajectory. I mean, this is an application where um, deep learning could really excel, and it's something that, I mean, it's tricky for humans to do, to synthesize images on multiple time points and all of this extra data, and then make a prediction um, about something in the future. I mean, it's something we don't even really try to do. Uh, so potentially big value add um, for deep learning in this, in this area. Um, and this is something that um, there has been some success with in breast imaging, um, and I'll show you Christoph Garris's work in that um, field in just a couple of slides. Okay. Um, so with that, I wanna highlight um, some work being done in our department by Christoph Garris and his group in um, detecting breast cancer. Uh, so they've been working in AI models for breast cancer for a very long time. Um, and more recently they've had, um, they've shown some really promising results in multimodal learning. So I'll walk you through this figure. Um, at the bottom, you can see the, uh, the medical images, the full field digital mammography. So that's your plastic mammography, the ultrasound image, and the digital breast tomosynthesis. So all of these images have their own models um, that can be used to predict breast cancer from that image. So all these images are fed through their individual or unimodal models. Um, and those extract features from the individual images. And then in addition to the image data, the, the model also considers these categorical variables. So that's the study date and the type of image modality used. And then these categorical variables are also transformed into embeddings. So they can be integrated with the image embeddings. And then finally, all of the embeddings are processed um, through the transformer encoder. And then the output is a prediction of whether breast cancer is present or not. Um, so as illustrated here on the right, um, when used for predicting whether cancer is present in the current exam, for all of the imaging modalities, when additional imaging modalities are used to make that prediction, the quality, the accuracy of the prediction increases. Um, so this is not the only way that this network can be used, and I alluded to this just about a minute ago. Um, so this network can also be used to predict whether someone will experience breast cancer in the future. Uh, so this network actually remains accurate um, in its predictions for up to five, 10 years. Um, so it's really showing that synthesis of this multimodal information can lead to really strong results um, and gives us predictions, strong results in predictions that humans wouldn't even attempt to make. Um, and these kinds of risk predictions could be used to better indiv individualize patient management. Okay. 
Okay, so now I will highlight some work by um, Nargis Razavian and her group in detecting Alzheimer's disease from brain MRI. So for Alzheimer's, early intervention is really important. It can alleviate symptoms, slow progression, and all of the new clinical trials um, for AD address mild to moderate AD. Uh, so this paper published um, last year by um, Nargis and her team, and generalizable deep learning models for early Alzheimer's disease detection from structural MRIs. So I'll present some of um, her results. And the goal was really to distinguish mild Alzheimer's disease and from mild cognitive impairment and cognitively normal individuals using structural MRI. So they used two different data sets, ADME and NACC. So that's Alzheimer's Disease Neuro Neuroimaging Initiative and National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center data sets. The NICC data set was used as an independent test set, so an external test set. They trained a 3D um, convolutional neural network um, as a multi-class classifier. So they have three classes, cognitive nor cognitively normal, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease. And they have about just over 2,000 images for each of the ADNI and NICC. So here's the, um, the performance of their models. So when the for if we look at over at ADNI, so this is the internal test set, getting really strong performance on cognitively normal and Alzheimer's disease, where it's a little bit more challenging for mild cognitive impairment. And on their external test set, NACC, again, um, really strong performance, classification performance. Um, the AUC is 0.9 for AD and 0.85 for cognitively normal. And again, a little bit challenging for um, MCI. Um, so in the future, um, their team is also looking towards multimodal learning. So while the results I just showed you involve predicting Alzheimer's from structural MRI, it's from T1 MRI. Um, so the, their goals moving forward are to incorporate different MRI contrasts, uh, PET, as well as um, electronic health record data. Okay, so I'll just quickly wrap up. Um, so we talked about AI for image interpretation. Again, the three tasks that we're usually concerned with, classification, object detection, and instance segmentation. Um, convolutional neural networks have been used for about a decade in these, um, for these tasks, and transformers are starting to become popular as well. Um, we talked about using classifiers for real-time exam guidance and also as a decision support tool where it can improve reader detection accuracy reduce inter-reader variability and also reduce read time. And we talked about um, the ability to potentially use um, these tools for future risk prediction. Um, so this is our prostate team on the left and all of these individuals have been really actively involved in um, the work I presented today. And I'll say thank you to Nargis and Christoph uh, for sharing some of their really um, interesting research uh, for this talk. Thanks so much. Uh, do we have any questions for Patricia? You know, I, I, I have a thought. Um, it, it's maybe akin to what Eric had uh, asked the, our first speaker about whether we can learn anything from the features or whatever the model is using to decide that it can predict cancer down the line or something like this, like see the future. If like you say, we're not really seeing anything obvious. What is, can it tell, can it teach us something? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And if we were using some kind of, you know, multimodal deep learning network, um, like um, Christoph has used and uh, Nargis and I are proposing, I think that um, especially, incorporating um, clinical variables and demographic variables, there'll be an ability to see kind of which features are being weighted highly by the model. Um, even if it's kind of um, um, in a sense where 
forget the word they use for this, um, where you use all the variables and then you start taking them out and seeing um, kind of where performance drops. Um, so I think that could be a mechanism to really see what features are useful and give us some insight into um, what the model is actually using and doing. Sure, right, like some kind of occlusion analysis well, or something. I think that's the word. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we have a question from the audience. Yeah, I have a question for the Alzheimer disease. Uh, so now Alzheimer disease is kind of a spectrum so I don't know for this study, what kind of uh, ground truth? Is it a clinical diagnosis or some uh, PET data uh, imaging? So, as a yeah, so truth? Nargis for this study was using labels from the, those image repositories, so ADNI and NACC. So they gathered um, images that, have, you know, no, that had known disease. So they had labels for MCI, Alzheimer's, and um, cognitively normal. Yeah, it's a clinical diagnosis. It's... Yes, yeah. Thanks. Okay, great. That wraps up our session. Thank you so much.